from when I'm serious. Now, the Kenya Bankers Association was registered in 1962. Over the years, it has evolved and today it stands as an institution that promotes development within the industry as well as economic growth, among other factors. A very warm welcome to The Trading Bell. My name is Malika Kazia. Today on the show, we feature the CEO of the Kenya Bankers Association, Habil Olaka, who's going to be talking to us about various factors that have affected the industry from the rate cap of 2016 to the Finance Act 2018 and more. But first, let's take a look at his profile. Dr. Habil Olaka is the Chief Executive Officer of Kenya Bankers Association. He is responsible for the strategic direction of the association under guidance from the KBA Governing Council. Previously, he was the Director of Operations of the East African Development Bank EADB based in Kampala after serving as the resident manager in Kenya. He earlier served the bank as the Head of Risk Management and as the Chief Internal Auditor. He holds a Doctor of Business Administration from USIU Africa, a First Class Honours BSc degree in Electrical Engineering from the University of Nairobi and an MBA in Finance from the Manchester Business School in the UK. His PhD study was on the influence of strategic leadership on the implementation of strategy in the commercial banks in Kenya. He is a member of the Institute of the Certified Public Accountants of Kenya and the CFA Institute. He is an alumnus of the Strathmore School of Accountancy and has a good command of the French language. Now, of course, we have Dr. Habil Olaka joining us today on The Trading Bell. He is the Chief Executive Officer of the Kenya Bankers Association. Welcome. Thank you. A pleasure to have you. In fact, as we talk about the Kenya Bankers Association, I do know that it promotes industry development, economic growth as well. But can you just give us a brief insight into some of the other you know, main areas that the KBA focuses on? Okay. Besides the, um, what you have mentioned in terms of uh, policy advocacy, we also find ourselves in a privileged position where we have got access to information from the industry in terms of feedback from the consumers of banking services. And that then enables us to position ourselves to be able to steer the industry in terms of initiatives that respond to those concerns or that feedback that you get from the market. So we have had a number of initiatives along those lines, like for example, the modernization of the clearinghouse through what you call the check truncation system it was purely a feedback from the market in terms of um, getting the clearinghouse modernized. Things like, for example, the Create Information Sharing Initiative, which um, was basically to create an information sharing mechanism within the country to address the credit market. That's also an initiative of uh, Kenya Bank Association. Okay. More recently, we have got, for example, the PESA link and yes. uh, similar kind of initiatives that we uh, respond to feedback that you're getting either from the market or from the banks themselves in terms of initiatives that KBA can run with on behalf of the industry. Okay, fantastic. So as, as we go along now with the conversation, let's take a look at the Finance Act 2018 because it, it was greatly debated, of course, there were a lot of, you know, apprehension at some point as to what's going to happen. And then when it did come into effect and we saw uh, a lot of different taxes implemented, one of them was the increased excise duty on bank charges that went from 10 to 20 percent. Mm -hmm. Now, banks earned an aggregate of 70.6 billion shillings in fees and commissions last year, indicating that the National Treasury will raise at least 7 billion from the tax. So uh, how has this new law affected the industry thus far in your opinion? You know, excess duty is a consumption tax. Mm -hmm. In other words, it's borne by the consumer of the banking services. Yes. And um, we do not see it having a significant impact as uh, the numbers indicate. You know, the number is moving from 10% to 20% and is doubling. Yes. And the impact may be felt like as if you know, it will be some earth-shaking, you know, um, kind of a bomb that will hit the sector. I don't think so. I think the whole thing will depend on, on, um, on uh, how the consumers will feel the impact on the increase in terms of excess duty. Now, I s think that going forward, 
most probably the other services because you see the banking services will now be compared together with other services the alternatives that the consumer has True. so instead of transacting on the banking in the banking sector for example he'll be thinking of to transact through say the mobile mm. and you see the excess duty on the mobile has also increased yes so that may not be quite an option for the consumer so you might find that um, it might have some moderate effect in terms of financial inclusion in terms of the progress that you're making uh, to get people included in the formal form financial services and the increase in cost may have some minimal impact there. Mm -hmm. but I don't think it will be something that will be so earth-shaking as to have a significant impact in terms of reversing the trend in terms of financial inclusion in the country. Okay, that's interesting. And as you said, it also does encompass a lot of the other options that consumers have. Mm -hmm. So there's not much wiggle room for them in that sense as well. Mm -hmm. But uh, now the Treasury also, of course, increased, as you said, excise duty on mobile money, 12% from 10. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Central Bank of Kenya Governor Patrick Njoroge said that during the Monetary Policy Committee briefing, he said the new tax could slow down cash flow into the economy. Mm -hmm. So despite what you've just said, do you, do, would you agree with that then? Yeah, I mean... At, at the end of the day, if um, the consumer feels that um, it's more expensive to transact through the, through the bank and therefore you find that most of the cash is actually avoiding the banking system, then it's not included within the formal economy. And I think that's the point that the governor is trying to bring across in the sense that um, rather than being a channel through the formal economy, it's actually being bypassing the formal economy. And that can have um, some significant impact in terms of, uh, for example, the lack of visibility. And it starts to bring challenges like, for example, on money laundering mm. and uh, you know, process of crime. Because if it's not channeled through the formal system, it becomes difficult to detect and then uh, address and control. So it's harder to monitor, of course, if it's not yes, a part of the formal it's chain. outside the formal, uh, the formal, formal system. Okay. Yeah. And, and another thing that, of course, has affected the banking industry, and that's since 2016. Uh, this year marks two years since the implementation of the Banking Amendment Act that introduced the capping of the interest rate at a maximum of 13%. Mm. Now, before that, the Central Bank of Kenya had the, uh, the KBRR that gave a recommended base rate, and it allowed banks to factor in their premiums to cover perceived risks. But banks largely largely ignored that rate as was seen and they did charge exorbitant rates as has been noted which led to the calls for this particular ceiling to be implemented. Now the IMF however insists that the rate cap has seen the credit taps for the private sector run dry because banks instead are basically opting to lend to the government and corporates. So the Kenya Bankers Association in fact uh, did uh, have a lobby group among others presented the proposal that pushed the removal of the rate cap uh, to the committee. So how does the banking sector in Kenya currently feel about the rate cap and, and your thoughts on its possible removal? Well, a number of issues come in there. One of them is the fact that I'm, uh, I think if you look back at the movement of the rates in the market and how it has behaved, um, uh, you'll clearly see the fact that um, we actually had caps earlier in the before uh, in the 90s. And before that, we actually had caps in terms of there were actually control rates. And then it was liberalized. Mm -hmm. So the, the controls were removed. Uh, liberalized and then allowed to move in free relationship uh, depending on the on the market movements now and what happened was that I'm um, uh, in the past by the way we have got cases where the rates have come significantly low I mean if you look at uh, the pre 1993 uh, period uh, the rates were um, an average of uh, close to um, uh, 14 percent over that period. Now in 1993 of course we had the, the golden bug period and the challenges that were there about yes. and uh, the rates shot up to an extent of almost 85% in the market. But that's a spike and then it comes back. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the overall period, the rates were you know, behaving depending on the movement in the market. Now even just before the low was passed in 2015, the average rates in the market were hovering around 16-17 on an average. Okay. Of course, the bigger um, uh, borrowers, the um, corporates, some of them were getting rates of in the range of 10 to 14 percent. So the, the capping itself happened at a time when the actual rates were trending downwards. Downward, okay. So if you look at the trend, it's actually coming downwards. In mm -hmm. other words, the rates can be controlled 
by other factors other than you know putting in um, you know a, a sledgehammer and you know uh, putting in the legislative controls. Yes. So and and the argument has always been that um, I think we need to address to identify the reasons why the rates are going up. Mm and then address those challenges so that you can let the rates come down by their own you know by their own forces rather than forcing it um, uh, the way we have done in Kenya and worldwide controls have not worked what you need to do is first of all address the reasons why the rates are high and then address those issues and the rates can come um, down by, by by themselves now um, uh, of course when the rates were when the controls are put in place I think they have got two issues there. One is on the on the deposit side, and then on the lending side. On the lending side, there's a cap which was put at four percent above the central bank rate. Yes. On the deposit side, there's a there's a floor, the minimum that a bank must pay to an interest earning account, which is at seventy percent of the central bank rate. Now, if you look at on the on the lending side, that the impact it has had is that um, because banks are not able to fit every available borrower within what is provided for in the law, banks have therefore been choosing only uh, applications whose risk profile can be fitted within the allowed in the law. So anything that fits within 14% and below is what you advance money to. Anything that whose risk profile is above the 14%, you turn them away and that happens to be the segment of the market that apparently, by the way, mm. is most productive and contributes most to the GDP of the country. That's the SME, the households and the like. So it's ironic. So the impact it has had is to slow down our economic, economic growth effectively. Yes. On the deposit side, it was meant to give an incentive to the borrow, to the, to the, to the, to the, to the, to the saver to be then to be able to put that money in the bank to earn some you know, additional uh, return. Mm -hmm. Now, the impact it has had is that, um, uh, one, we do not have adequate disposable income, and so between um, um, raising money for your very basic needs and having access to put in a, in a deposit, you rarely have enough for your very basic needs, and mm -hmm. so there is no impact in terms of uh, boosting the growth in the, on the deposit side. So basically the law from both sides has not quite worked and, mm -hmm. and um, you know, pushed the market in the direction in which it was intended to be. Banks, of course, because of the cap, have found alternatives. So they either look for high quality borrowers who can fit within the cap, or when the government is pushing, or rather coming to the market to borrow, mm -hmm. and they are a safe haven, banks will put money there. Yes. So as long as there's an appetite from the government, you'll always put money there because on a risk adjusted basis, it's much safer mm -hmm. to lend to the to the government than to lend to a risky borrower whose risk profile is quite significant. And when you adjust the returns on um, for risk, you find that um, uh, the gov return from the government is much higher than the risk adjusted return from an SME or an, a normal borrower. Okay. So I think the bottom line of it is that um, it has not worked in the way it was meant to have worked, mm -hmm. and therefore we need to relook at it and address it. And KBR has been pushing for that. Fortunately. Yes. Um, and the last um, uh, parliamentary session, mm -hmm. they actually really looked at it and uh, adjusted mm -hmm. the flow on the deposit side. But we'll still continue pushing okay. for the cap on the lending side to be addressed because then it will unlock lending yes. to the SME, which is the most um, productive segment of the Kenyan economy. Yes, true. Yeah. All right. Well, as you say, then they should factor in the natural progression of uh, the rates and let it flow with the factors that affect it naturally, as opposed to putting the ceiling, which is then costing SMEs and uh, most smaller businesses that do contribute a great chunk, of course, to the economy, a majority yeah. chunk, if you will. Yeah. So as, as we close up, um, banks have, despite this, continued to rake in profits with uh, their profitability increasing by as much as 18 percent as of the last uh, couple of uh, numbers that have come in. This despite that rate cap. As you say, the, of course, the government that they can uh, uh, do business with and more other sorts of uh, um, customers as well. But as we approach the end of the year, what are your predictions in terms of profitability, despite the factors we've discussed that influence the banking sector in the country as we close up? I think 2018, um, you look at it with reference to 2017. 2017 was a particularly challenging year. We had the drought at the beginning of the year. We had the pro elongated elections that, you know, somehow yes. just could not come to an end. And of course, we had the cap. 
True. So that, in a way, contributed to the fact that business was not picking up and therefore credit was not uh, flowing out and mm -hmm. therefore it affects the profitability of banks. Now, when you look at 2018, I think with that background, one is that um, uh, we had some good rains at the beginning of the year. Um, elections are behind us. There was a handshake, which brought in quite some, um, you know, unity, uh, unity and uh, a feeling of the fact that elections are now behind us. We can now build on, uh, on the framework that has been put in place. And then the CAPS, although not lifted yet, at least we can see there is some um, engagement and there's a possibility that in the near future mm -hmm. it would be, um, um, you know, lifted. But also, banks are now, of course, using the option of uh, the fact that the government has got the appetite for for, 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 for liquidity um, for, for the time being. And so I do not, in terms of profitability, I don't think banks will have such a, a, a huge growth in terms of profitability, but I think they'll do better than they did in 2017, in 2018. So there's recovery, there's healing, and there's potential, of course, for the future. Yes. So we can look at 2018 with a lot of optimism. And of course, as we look into 2019, I think uh, with all these challenges being pushed out of the way, I think we'll see a much better 2019 than we have been able to see 2018. All right. Thank you very much, Habil Olaka, for joining us on The Trading Bell. Thank you. Well, that was Habil Olaka, the CEO of Kenya Bankers Association, talking to us on The Trading Bell today. On that note, we're going to take a look at the market analysis. Um, the gainers for this week are coming from a very low base uh, last week. Uh, the likes of uh, BOC and uh, the other gainers that are actually in the market, they're coming from uh, prices that were quite close to their 52-week lows. And we have seen some uh, speculative market entries into the counters, which has led them to close uh, as the week's gainers. Time now for the market analysis on Trading Bell. Joining me is Harrison Gitao from Apex Africa to shed some light on the numbers that we have this week. Welcome, Harrison. Thank you very much. Let's begin now with our gainers, and we've seen quite a few of them, which you said were unexpected. Yeah. Um, the gainers for this week are coming from a very low base uh, last week. Uh, the likes of uh, BOC and uh, the other gainers that are actually in the market, they're coming from... Uh, prices that were quite close to their 52-week lows. And we have seen some uh, speculative market entries into the counters, which has led them to close uh, as the week's gainers. OK. Yeah. So those were, of course, we had BOC Kenya Limited, Liberty Kenya Holdings, and more. But now let's look at the top losers. Surprisingly, we're seeing Kenya Airways Limited up there. And uh, it's gone down about 11.74%. Yeah. Now, we have seen that they've reduced the number of flights, the direct flight from Kenya to the US. Yeah. And they say that's because of low demand during winter. So it's going to carry on up until March, these yeah. reduced number of flights. Yeah. Uh, do you think that's what we can attribute to this? Yeah, I think that is uh, what has been attributed to the decline in the market. Once they announced the daily direct flights to and fro uh, the US, there was a lot of uh, market activity. There were a lot of expectations, especially on the top line, uh, to what uh, those flights actually mean for the firm. But now that they've said that uh, they're looking at cutting back, which is quite, I think, a good strategy because it doesn't uh, add value to run uh, flights that have uh, very low uh, cabin factors. But I think that announcement has uh, sort of led to a market uh, correction. Okay. Yeah. And at the same time, you know, we had seen that uh, when they did launch that flight, there was a lot of uh, speculation and a lot of expectation from the fact that this flight would increase exports and it would ease all of that, all of those processes, help the economy. From your perspective, um, you know, how, how, how prudent is it to look at that, to that uh, with that much optimism? Um, I think it's uh, quite prudent. Uh, I think the biggest 
uh, source of revenue for KQ is actually passengers and not cargo. Mm. So once the passenger side is uh, not as high as they had anticipated, I think it's still wise to cut back and sort of grow demand. They are talking of uh, partnering with some local uh, flights over there just to try and uh, raise awareness and raise interest of uh, passengers coming this way. Okay, yeah. all right. One of the other losers we see here, EA Portland uh, Cement Company Limited, and uh, it's gone down actually by 9.59%. Yeah, uh, I think that comes uh, as a result of uh, the recently announced decline uh, in month-on-month -month, uh, cement consumption. Month-on-month uh, -on -month cement uh, fell by about 5 million tons in the okay. country. So it's, it's quite negative for uh, cement makers in the country and that is reflected mainly in Portland. All right, yeah. so those were our top gainers and losers. But now let's look at the NSE performance there. The NSE 20 share index seemed to have had a minimal increase of 0.01%, but the NSE 25 share index also had one of 0.13%. These gains, very significant? Uh, I think there is, they're quite significant. Uh, it's sort of uh, a small reprieve in a time where we are talking about uh, the NSE 25 actually falling by about 24% year to date. I think the, the slight uptick is quite positive and uh, we are attributing it to increased uh, local uh, activity. Okay, so yeah. in a return of investor confidence then? Yeah, so some, some sort of uh, return. Okay. Not so much, but still there. We're getting there, I guess. Yeah. And uh, now finally, the top movers of uh, the week. We've seen Safaricom Limited, of course. The volume uh, is uh, quite massive there. Yeah. Uh, for Safaricom, is no surprise. It's yes. actually uh, the market, usually the market leader. But uh, we've seen uh, some increased uh, interest, mainly with the announcement of uh, the partnership with the uh, Western Union and seeing that uh, actually diaspora remittances contribute about come to about the third largest contributor of uh, our forex uh, exchange, forex income. That's, I think that's quite positive for, for Safaricom. All right, and I mean, they do have 29.6 million customers, so yeah. clearly it's reflective uh, of those numbers as well. But another one of our top movers here is Barclays Bank. Yeah, uh, for Barclays, I think it's uh, in anticipation of uh, their nine months uh, numbers to be announced uh, soon. Okay. Uh, maybe, I, I don't want to uh, read much into the volumes yes. uh, the volumes are not quite huge mm. but i think it's a market sort of uh, a few investors aligning themselves okay yeah. all right yeah. thank you so much for that thank harrison with that market analysis and now we're going to go into markets 101. Well, now it's time for our question on the street, something that you want to know about the NSC, the Securities Exchange, or anything finance-related. Let's have that. Uh, my name is Joe Mishiri. Uh, my question is, uh, should I be investing in a hedge fund? And what is a hedge fund? Uh, thank you very much for the question. Uh, thank you, actually, for raising interest in hedge funds. Hedge funds are basically funds that mainly are mandated to invest in very risky ventures. They like the high risk because of the high return and uh, whether or not you should invest in them depends on uh, your risk appetite. If you are a risky, if you are a risk seeker, you can go for them. If you are risk averse, which uh, most investors are, ideally you should, you should avoid them. All right, thank you very much, Harrison, for clearing that up for us. And now it's time for the NSC Historical Fact.
Well, that brings this episode of The Trading Bell to a close. Of course, thank you very much, Harrison, for joining us. Thank you for having me. And giving us a little bit more insight into the market and the numbers. And of course, we also uh, did speak to uh, the CEO of the Kenya Bankers Association about the Finance Act 2018. We also talked about the rate cap and more. Now, with that, we bring this episode to a close. But of course, you can keep up with us on the social media handles that are appearing on your screen. Thank you so much for watching. We'll catch you next time. My name is Malika Kazia.